respect to China, you have to take a lot of grains of salt. And this has been an issue for economists for two or three decades, at least the, at least the amount of time that I've been working in China beginning in the late 1980s. Uh, I'm not sure that any economist worth his or her all salt be, believes that the 7.9 and actually the current number, 6.5%, is accurate. It's probably 50% of that number. But how did China grow? And there is a very important, impressive story to be told about China. And one can really trace the modern reform era of China back to 1978 following the death of Mao Zedong and the arrival of Deng Xiaoping. And he toured the southern part of China, near Shenzhen and Hong Kong, and saw factories working. And he was obviously aware of what's going on in the rest of the world and decided that the model of Chinese reform really needed to be revised. And so he created what was then labeled, and still is labeled, a socialist market economy. And that is today's guiding philosophy ever since 1978 about what reforms China is embarking upon. And one of the hallmarks of the socialist market economy model has been to maintain the state controlling the backbone firms, the state-owned enterprises and the state-owned banks, there are four state-owned banks, that those two sectors, in the financial and the real sector, really account for the vast majority of the population in terms of workers, and start this agricultural reform, allowing farmers to actually keep what they're growing or some portion in two or three provinces, test it out for nine months, for a year, see what happened, and rejigger the format, and then, through concentric circles, broaden reform throughout the country. Today, many policymakers, even in advanced countries, would do well to understand that approach rather than one fell swoop reforms. So, coming in, coming in over time, where China has a huge domestic market, which Earl, Earl mentioned that, that I've said before, is extraordinarily poor. You go outside of the big cities in China and you will see people living in squalor. And that's why the per capita GDP is a far more important indicator of what is going on in China. Well, as they began to realize they wanted to grow more and more, but most of the population, particularly in the western part of the country, does not and did not have purchasing power, that's why they focused on the export side. And what happened was, as the exports began to grow, the center and the western part of the economy began to languish, and there was not enough concentration on growing the economy based on a consumer economy. And so we've gotten to the point today where there's been a lot of successful reforms, but they have overextended themselves in terms of exports. Uh, there is still the, the the real Achilles heel of the economy where the state-owned enterprises, the large chemical companies, petrochemicals, steel, coal, are all run by the party. And it's a closed system. The raison d'etre for the party are the state-owned enterprises and vice versa. And so what they are now confronting as their growth is slowing, which frankly has little to do with the trade war, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, they have painted themselves in the corner, and this is why I began talking about the, the notion of a socialist market economy. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. And that's what they've been trying to do, and they've had a large enough economy and a large enough of an export engine that they've been able, frankly, to go through with enough slack in the system. But now it's, they're, they're getting caught up. And, the numbers that, that Earl has mentioned, one needs to take into account. All those numbers are accurate, but there's a huge scale effect here. This is a, this is a country of 1.3 billion people. And so many of these numbers are flavored by the fact that China is huge, no matter where you go. So that's why I think, in large part, why it is where we are today that China has had 
a pretty impressive growth record, but the contradictions now, the chickens have come home to roost. Well, let's, uh, I'll, it's an interesting. When I started looking at the bank sheets when, we were, when I was at the World Bank and we had actually open access to these state-owned banks, it was the non-performing loans of the four state-owned banks on average were upwards of 30, 35%. Today, it's about 45%. Now, most of this debt, up until recently, is denominated in Chinese currency. So it's walled off from the, from the world market. But in the last two years, they have begun the government, through these banks, and through some of the, the key state of enterprises, have begun to borrow in dollar-denominated debt, which is a, quite a conundrum for the Chinese, because as you probably have read, they want the RMB to be a currency of exchange for the world. So the, the knife edge that China is on, is, and again, I want to underline this point, this has nothing to do with the trade war at all, is they really are on a bicycle and they're, and they're running out of room because Xi Jinping, more than any other leader in our lifetime of China, is not about to surrender. In fact, I would argue that the trade war is being used, it's, it is the most convenient excuse, it's a, it's a dream come true for Xi Jinping to be able to point to the US ganging up on them so they can actually put even more money in the state of enterprises. And what is driving this is what, what Robert and I agree about completely is the preservation of social stability in this economy.